Maria Luisa get up here and talk. So Maria Luisa was born in Guatemala uh, during the worst of the conflict, and in fact her father was disappeared by the government in Guatemala. Um, afterwards, she fled to the U.S. and received uh, political assignment, as, uh, asylum. Excuse me. She says she's not, but it says here on the paper that she is a leading voice for human rights and peace, and she works in torture and violence across our hemisphere. Uh, she's worked for a lot of different places, and now she works uh, with SOA Watch, and she's a uh, organizer for them, and we are very excited to have her join us. So, Mary Louisa. Maria Luisa. Maria Luisa. Here. If you want to use the microphone, you can. If you don't want to, I just have my phone up here so I can kind of keep track of time because I want to leave time for uh, conversation. So, can so everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. So, thanks so much for having me. And again, my name is Maria Luisa. I'm field organizer with School of the Americas Watch. And Today is actually my 11th month working as field organizer, so I'm very excited. It's my first vigil um, that I'm actually organizing, so um, last year I was able to go and meet a lot of people, and I'm sure I will see uh, a lot of new, but at the same time familiar faces, because I feel like I'm sort of in, uh, in family right now <laughs> with all these stories that I've heard. So it's really great to, to meet all of you, and I hope we can continue this conversation uh, outside of this space as well. Um, my hope is that by the end of this conversation, I will have, um, as, the, as the flyer said, connected the dots between the issue of migration and immigration in the United States specifically with SOA violence. And I'm going to do that by telling you a little bit about sort of my personal story, um, but link it to U.S. Central America relations, and that would segue into talking just very briefly because all of you know a little bit about SOA and SOA Watch, but a little bit about that history of where the movement comes from, and then talking about sort of how that relates to foreign policy, and then um, specifically the Northern Triangle of Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, bringing it to the current um, situation right now. So that's my plan. So I hope. I hope I get that um, out. So, about me, um, I was, I, as, as Andrew said, I was born in Guatemala. My family's from Guatemala. I was born in 1982 uh, under the dictatorship of Efraín Rios Montt, who was an SOA graduate. And this was the height of the internal armed conflict. It was a 36 year conflict that, by the end of it, according to the official uh, Truth Commission report, uh, Guatemala Memory of Silence which was um, sponsored by the United Nations. Um, 50,000, 45, 50,000 disappearances, a death toll of about 200,000, mm -hmm. and a million internally displaced people, and hundreds of thousands crossing not only to the United States, but to the bordering country of Mexico. And uh, the, the worst massacres, there were over 600 massacres in, in Guatemala, and before that there was no truth commission that could really quantify what that really meant. Um, and that's also because there's a really high indigenous population um, in Guatemala. But the worst human rights atrocities during this 36 year period that started in 1960 and ends with the signing of the peace accords in 1996 was 1982 to 1983 under the 18 months that Rios Montt was in power uh, approximately 83% of all human rights violations committed during the 36-year conflict were, were committed during this period. To give you an idea, 18 months, 83% of the human rights violations. Um, this is the context I was born into. Um, I, I heard a, uh, a, a friend here in the group that uh, was familiar with the Grupo de Apoyo Mutuo, that, that was uh, basically the, the equivalent of what the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, which is more familiar, to, to some people in Argentina, the mothers who were searching for their loved ones. My mother was part of that group before she had to leave. And when I say I went into exile, I went with her because I was two, so I don't remember that. Um, my father was disappeared on August 12th, 1983, four days after Rios Montt was taken out by another coup replaced by his defense minister, Mejia Vitores. 
So, um, why am I telling you this story? Uh, well, it it's relevant to the history of SOA violence in Latin America, and it also relates to the movement to shut down the the school as well. Um, one of the one of the people, even though even though the case for my father's disappearance is still open, it's actually um, been before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights for uh, 30 years now. Um, and with all the impunity that that implies, one of the people that was involved in his disappearance was an SOA grad himself as well. And so it's, it's, a per it's personal to me, but it also mirrors and echoes the stories of not just thousands of other people in Guatemala, but throughout the entire hemisphere. And I'll get into that when I talk a little bit about the sort of history of the United States uh, foreign policy in Latin America. And specifically what this means to Central America, uh, United States and Central America have had a very closely connected relationship. Um, it, 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 Central America has always been in the United States backyard. Um, and with everything that that implies, and even as early as um, the Monroe Doctrine in the early 1800s, um, you know, Monroe declares, you know, the, the, the United States is the sole power in the hemisphere, and that sort of sets the stage for the relations that would ensue after. Um, and so, the, the School of the Americas, um, it was founded in 1946, just after the Second World War, and it was based in Panama, in the Canal Zone, and it, in 1984, is relocated to where it's now located in Columbus, Georgia, at Fort Benning. And a, just a brief, brief history of that, um, it was renamed in 2001 under intense pressure. In fact, it closed for a couple weeks. In, at the end of 2001, only to reopen in 2002 under a new name that is uh, a name that nobody ever remembers because it's called the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, WINSEC. Mm -hmm. And I saw someone with a button, and yeah, do you want to read what it says? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, new name, same shame. Exactly. Yeah. So, it, they did a rebranding of sorts, and because if you look at the location, the school, its mission, its teachers, its graduates, um, and its results, it's, it's very much the same. Uh, a couple years after that, they began to, they, meaning the Pentagon, began to classify the names of the graduates. Before, it was, it was easy, and actually, nobody really knew what the school was until a lot of things were happening in El Salvador, primarily in the 1980s, um, which is why the vigil is happening in November. Um, El Salvador was a hot spot uh, for United States intervention during its civil war in the context of the Cold War to thwart <coughs> communism. That was the, the excuse. But United States, during the 1980s, was pumping $1 million of military aid per day in the smallest country in the region. Um, and we see the effects today. So, under intense pressure, in 1996, after the University of Central America massacre, which was on November 16, 1989, which we are commemorating this year, the 25th anniversary of the six Jesuits that were murdered, along with Elba Ramos, who was the housekeeper, and Selena Ramos, her 16-year-old daughter, um, most of those authors, the material authors of their <coughs> murders were School of the Americas graduates. Mm -hmm. Under intense pressure, the Pentagon finally releases in 1996 what is now known as the torture manuals. Um, they're manuals that were used uh, for the School of the Americas for a set number of years, and they encourage extrajudicial killings, kidnappings, and torture so some of the most egregious human rights violations. And the, I use the case of El Salvador because a lot of people can relate to it, a lot of people know about this, a lot of people know that in 1980, 
uh, Archbishop Romero was also murdered at the hands of SOA graduates. Not long after, there was a massacre called El Mosote in the town of El Mosote where there was only one survivor, um, Bufina. And there, after the, the Civil War in El Salvador, there was an impunity law that was passed and a lot of the perpetrators of the violence actually live here in the United States. Um, that amnesty law, I'm happy to say, is actually gonna expire in a few weeks. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, especially because now there's a different president. He's uh, from the FMLN, which was the insurgency group during, during the time when the Arena Party, the right-wing party, who was founded by Roberto Dovison, another SOA grad, um, was, was pumping out death squads to kill its own population. So, by the end of these civil wars, let me put it into a bigger context. Throughout all of Latin America, at different points, but pretty much during the same periods, the 70s, the 80s, you have what was called the National Security Doctrine that took on different particularities in different countries. In Guatemala, they became experts at what was the systematic practice of disappearances. So it's no surprise that in Guatemala there were 40, over 45,000 disappearances. In a country at that, at that moment there were between seven and eight million people. Argentina also had many, many disappearances, about 30,000. And actually I was, I was talking today, uh, earlier today, today is the 30th anniversary of the publication of their Truth Commission report, which documents this. So, after the Cold War, what you have is this pseudo transition to democracy, but what that really means in the context of Latin America, you, you see this ushering in of neoliberal policies. And the same landowning elites securing their own economic interests. And we'll see how that manifests itself more recently with the question of mining and, and hydroelectric dams in, in not only in Guatemala, but Honduras, El Salvador, um, et cetera. And <clears throat> so Guatemala, history of intervention, the first, the first big coup in, in, in Latin America to the first country that really said no because they brought about a land reform that really did bring about change was in 1954, just one year after the coup, the CIA-sponsored coup in Iran. Um, then you have the internal armed conflict that, by the way, in that Truth Commission report that I mentioned earlier, it does document the relationship between the military training and the School of the Americas. Uh, and now, in Guatemala, there is a general that was overseeing these first truth campaigns, Otto Perez Molina, who is in power, an SOA grad, and he denies that there was genocide, for obvious reasons. It's not very convenient especially in the context of a recent genocide trial that put on trial for the first time ever a former head of state. The, the sentence was overturned and they have to start the trial all over again next year. Um, in El Salvador, uh, what does, what does uh, US foreign policy look like? Well, in the 1980s, I've already explained it, there was a lot of military intervention, a lot of death squads, a lot of exporting this training to create military solutions for political problems. And uh, the death toll in El Salvador, which is again the smallest country, 70,000 deaths. Um, and Honduras was sort of the, the battleground for a lot of this, for a lot of the counterinsurgencies. You might remember the Contras. And um, even the invasion in 1954 in Guatemala was staged from Honduras as a base. It was known as USS Honduras. Um, not for any, for, you know, I mean, uh, for obvious reasons. And in 2009, we'll see how this affects Honduras through the SOA grad-led coup on January 28th. And so, yeah, so, so it's a, Honduras, as I said, is a testing ground for military operations. And the two countries that I'll talk about later are going to be Honduras and Colombia because they're a very unique case right now. So during this conflict, it's easy to imagine why people would be fleeing, um, not just internally, 
from one, one town to another. But in this context, people were fleeing for their lives. They were leaving everything. A lot of refugees went to neighboring Mexico. Um, and just remember in this context, all of Latin America was under some form of military regime. Mexico, even, in the, even though it was considered a democracy, it was still disappearing its own people as well, even though there were many exiles that went to Mexico. But what you have is fleeing from Honduras, fleeing from El Salvador, and fleeing from Guatemala, but mostly from El Salvador and Guatemala. And then you get fleeing further up north to the United States. So, Talking about immigration, um, I'm always hesitant to use the term current unaccompanied child uh, crisis or current immigration crisis because I do see it as a continuation of, of, of the past. Um, I consider myself to be part of one of the, those waves of children that came uh, at one point. Granted, I, I came and I was able to receive political asylum, one of the very few cases, mind you, it was very hard to make a case for political asylum when the United States is legitimizing these supposed democracies. And that wasn't just a case of Guatemala, there was a case of El Salvador too. And so um, I kind of feel like it's coming full circle because my mom and I, we did come through the sanctuary movement during that period. So it's very interesting to be in front of so many of mm. you tonight. Um, and so, School of the Americas has, and not, not only School of the Americas, but U.S. foreign policy, but through the, the lens of School of the Americas, you see through this history, it's not an aberration of U.S. foreign policy. It's a very clear example of it. It's what we always say in, in, in the movement. And, and why? Because you are training to undermine democratically elected governments. Um, I, I can't explain it any other way. And now, the violence is much more nuanced because under democracy, you see more massacres, more displacements, more criminalization, and who are you criminalizing? You're criminalizing pretty much the same people you were attacking under the national security doctrine of the 1980s. And this brings me to sort of the more current wave of immigration, and there's ebbs and flows, and so yes, there's this unprecedented number of undocumented, or unaccompanied minors, but there's a reason for that too. With a lot of money coming into countries like Honduras, especially after the coup, which was legitimized by the United States, they made great efforts to legitimize it and legitimize the elections that ensued afterwards. Um, you, have, you don't have military aid, but you do have aid in the form of development, et cetera, but you're giving money to the same corrupt regimes that are repressing their own population. And in the case of Honduras specifically, as a result of the coup, what you see for the very first time recently is that 29% of all unaccompanied minors crossing the border and being stopped at the border are not from El Salvador, which historically has been the number one country to come to the United States, followed by Guatemala, to Honduras. For the very first time, the highest number of migrants coming to the United States that are youth are from Honduras. And it's important to make that connection. Um, it, it just, what that means to me is the chickens are coming home to roost. And, and this is funded through our tax dollars. Um, and so when you, when you take a moment and just kind of think about that, it's, it's no surprise, uh, given the, the sort of panorama with, with, with the current immigration and the debate around immigration reform, immigration in the United States is closely linked to national security policy. And when you have an immigration policy that's linked to national security policy, you can expect to see the criminalization of migrants. And you can expect to see more criticism of Obama having um, supposedly propagated and exacerbated this crisis because of the DACA that was passed, which is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, 
um, it, it, it doesn't give them a, a legal status. They're, a, a lot of people say they're un, undocumented um, because it's either here or there and it's something that they have to renew every year. But it does allow for them to work and it's a very specific group that can qualify for DACA. And so it is used as like a political battlefield. Um, and, and it's not just the Republicans that, that are linking it to a national security policy as Democrats too. Um, so, thanks. So the waves are similar because it's very closely linked to the immigration waves. That is very close to closely related to the U.S. foreign policy then and now. Only now you see it in the form of free trade policy. Um, SOA violence is not against communism anymore, it's against terrorism, it's against narco-trafficking, it's against organized crime, and when you can use these big uh, words that send off alarms, it's easy to see why you would pump so much money into these programs that, that mirror what, 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 what looks to be like another Plan Colombia, and it's hailed as a success among many people, but they forget to mention that since 2000 in, in Colombia, there have been 6,000 extrajudicial executions under Plan Colombia. And it's actually what Otto Perez Molina, the new president of Guatemala, is calling for. He says, if we need to, to change anything, we actually need a Plan Colombia in Guatemala. And what that means is we need to kill more people. We need to keep criminalizing our people because they're the ones that are, are getting in the way of us basically selling off all of our natural resources. Guatemala right now has potentially the, the, the largest gold mine in Central America. It's called the Marlin Mine in San Marcos. Maybe you, some of you have heard of it. Um, but it's not just Guatemala in that situation, it's Honduras. They are displacing the same populations. You have the, the political prisoners that you see are not people that are trying to <laughs> brave hell or anything. They're, they, what they're trying to do is they're trying to defend their territory. They're trying to defend territory that's been part of their ancestry, part of their culture. Um, and those who dare to speak up and they're on the front lines, they're the first ones to be targeted. In the first five months of, of this year, in fact, uh, the, the National University of Honduras has documented 33 massacres in Honduras. I'm not talking about the 1980s. I'm talking about this, this year, the first five months of 2014. So, it seems very clear to me that we need to stand and struggle with the immigration rights movement if we're going to start to change this culture of violence. Because until we start recognizing the true root causes of migration and not just say it's something new or it's just a humanitarian crisis and what are our obligations and if it's morally right or wrong, we, if we don't address really what's causing this, uh, we're, we're leaving a big puzzle, a piece out of the puzzle, sorry. And it's closely connected to the work that we do to close the SOA because it's, it's clear to us that the violence that's being exported from the United States to the countries is creating this, this, this phenomenon that, that continues today. Again, it's not a new thing. It's definitely not new. It's, it's, it's a continuation of, of the past. Um, and I would, I would like to mention, I heard somebody mention the, the, the steward vigil. It's really important to the movement that we stand and struggle with, with the, the folks that do the vigil at Stewart in a town called Lumpkin, Georgia. Now Stewart detention facility is not a prison. It should be called a prison, but they're called immigrant detention facilities. In the United States, there is a lot of money to be made out of the criminalization of migrants. And this one in particular happens to be the largest in the United States. It's owned by the Cor Corrections Corporation of America, CCA. And once you start seeing all these systems and these mechanisms that criminalize migrants, it's easy to see that when we're talking about SOA violence, we need to start also talking about violence that happens here in our communities, and not just Latin American and migrant communities. Uh, 
you know, we can think of recent examples. We can see the sort of militarization of the police that ha that's happened in, in towns like Ferguson recently. The Pentagon has so much money now, they're just throwing so much money at the police forces and they're militarizing the police. And I said this earlier, if you see what happened in the 1980s, and just, just if somebody whispered that this person is subversive, they were deemed a, a communist and you were disappeared, you were murdered, or you had to leave. Today, that sort of targeting is happening. And if you think of the role of the military under a civil government, a civilian regime, they're supposed to defend a territory, defend borders. Central America has not had any foreign wars. But what it has done, instead of looking outside and protecting the borders, is looked inside. And it's starting to criminalize and target these people. It's doing it again. And when you have a militarized police, who do you think the enemy is? It's not somebody, a foreign, a foreign country. It's a civilian population. And it's happening here. Maybe not as overtly as, as, as the examples I've, I've set forth in, in, in these, you know, 20, 30 minutes now, but it's happening. And only by connecting those struggles are we gonna start really thinking of concrete solutions to create a culture of peace. Right now we have a culture of, of militarism, culture of violence, and we do need a culture of accountability. And we do need to start working against impunity. You know, I, as, as the daughter of a disappeared, I do think of, you know, the crimes of the past as something that are still very relevant in the present, especially in the case of, of, of disappearances, because the disappearance legally, uh, it, you, you strip a person of their, their, their personhood. I, if that, does that make sense? The, the person, every day they don't appear, it's perpetuating on a daily basis many, many, many human rights that violations. And it's something that, that families of the disappeared live every day for that reason as well. But, so I'd like to hold people accountable for those crimes because it's true, if you, if you don't come to account with the past, you're, you, you, you will continue impunity. If it, if it doesn't just stay in the past. But there's also so many cases of, of human rights violations in the present, even though we don't have access to the names of the SO, SOA grads. You know, they started classifying the names in around 2003, 2004. But we do know these human rights violations exist in countries like Colombia, in countries like Honduras, where the coup was led by SOA grads. In countries like Paraguay, where in 2012, the coup was led by an SOA grad. In countries like Colombia, where the head of the National Armed Forces is an SOA grad. <coughs> It's almost like a rite of passage. If you wanna, if you wanna move up the ranks, you need to go to the SOA. And um, I think I'll leave it at, at that for now. Uh, I, I definitely think that I was, I was encouraged to hear that a lot of you are with the immigrants' rights movement. I think it's, it only makes sense to, to do that, and for, for obvious reasons. And um, I hear a lot of you are part of the anti-militarism movement, and I think that they, you're. We're natural allies in that sense, and and you know it's why we're going to go to to, to Lumpkin again this year. It's, it's the poorest country in Georgia. Um, county, thank you. <laughs> it's the poorest county in Georgia. Population of 1,300. The the detention population is 1,800. Um, so we're actually going to have the, the 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 vigil on Saturday morning and not on Friday, as we have done in the past, to hope, and we hope to get a bigger turnout. Potentially, it would be the, the largest vigil at any detention facility in the United States. So, uh, yeah, like I said, I'll leave it at that. And I, I would love to hear your, your questions or comments. And, and I hope that, I know that was a lot of information, and I hope that made some sense. So, I have to congratulate you as a young person. I'm listening to you, born in Guatemala, came here in political <laughs> asylum, asylum. And you gave us a history lesson of the, what the U.S. Uh, none of, but probably a lot of us couldn't tell what the Monroe Doctrine was. So I congratulate you on you know as much more history about that than several, a lot of us in this room. 
the history of everything. I, I just uh, just amazed at your history lesson you gave us, and I just have to congratulate you for that. Seeing a young person like yourself. Yeah. You know, you know, for you. When you're talking about, I think there's um, the, there's some things that could help to enliven what you're protesting against, and that is who owns the gold mine? Who are the people who own it? How do you protest against them? Do the Koch brothers own it? Who owns it? You know, that, that would be interesting to know at an international level. Which, which billionaires own that mine? How do you get their name into the situation? When you're talking about privatizing, privatized prison systems, who are the people who are getting the money out of this? Which, which billionaires are the owners of these things? So, so that they are not without faces. So you know, you're, not, you're not only talking about a, um, something that's um, abstract, but that has a real face on it. Small correction, it was June 20, 28th. Um, 2009. Yes, 2009. Did I not say 2009? <laughs> you, no, you said January. Oh, June, yeah. <laughs> the notes, the notes. Um, there has been, as you said, a, a great militarizing of the police, and um, in Honduras since then, um, and it is something that we're trying to get. Uh, much more uh, recognition of. Um, I, I now work with uh, the Support Network as well, and that is something that has just fallen off the map as far as anything in the world. And I guess I could say it's, it's very easy for the media to overlook the things that are happening in any of the countries. Along the line, she was talking about the gold mines. Do you know what corporations are behind it, like Fortune 500? Most, most of the mining companies are actually, I think about 70% of all mining companies, or all the mines in the world are Canadian. They're owned by ca Canadian companies. Um, so that kind of debunks.